Go ahead and get started here. Uh, this talk will be somewhat similar to the last talk uh, in that it deals with uh, OpenStreetMap analytics. Um, but I guess the big question that I have uh, when I look at a map is who, who, how many people made this map and who are they? So uh, this talk is a little more place-based, um, but it's very similar in, uh, in the nature and of uh, the previous one uh, in terms of trying to visualize OpenStreetMap through looking at the project history. Uh, my name is Sterling Quinn. I am uh, just finished up uh, some graduate work at Penn State University. That's where most of this work was completed. Um, and then I'll be starting at Central Washington University in, as an assistant professor in the geography department there. So if you're from the Seattle area, I hope to be, be in touch and be around in the future. Um, so what we're dealing with is, uh, is looking at uh, OpenStreetMap history and learning about what happened in this project, particularly who was involved. So uh, many of you might be familiar that OpenStreetMap publishes these big history dump files. There's actually two that are utilized here. One of the files has the actual geometries in it and tags. Uh, the other one is the change set history, which uh, has the editor comments uh, that then you can then link to the edits and uh, learn a little bit about the motivations behind the edits. Uh, so those are the two files that are, uh, that are used in this analysis. Uh, but this is, I talk more about data visualization, not so much about data processing. Um, OSM history data is fundamentally XML. It's really big, but we can we have ways to deal with that. Um, and as you saw in the previous talk, there's a lot of really smart people working on frameworks for um, calculating all kinds of statistics and extracting this history. So I'm not going to focus on that part. Um, what I will talk about is um, how to visualize and, and more than that, make sense of what's going on in the history thinking about what do we want to learn from this and how could we make it interactive so that we could how the, so that we could learn even more. Um, this is related to a strain of research uh, in academia. It's called visual analytics. Um, and this really grew up around the time big data also grew up. Um, partially, uh, well, there was a lot of funding from the US federal government in the years after 9-11. Uh, we, after that time, we had a lot of uh, surveillance and sensors bringing in lots of information that needed to be processed in real time. And that led to a lot of academic research on, on how to visualize all this data that was coming in. But since that time, visual analytics has been applied outside those contexts to a lot of other things. For example, understanding crowdsource projects. Because with crowdsource projects like Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap, we have tons of data coming in all the time and we want to make sense of it. Um, these are some screenshots of different um, uh, visualization uh, projects that have been undertaken to understand crowdsource data. Uh, in the upper left is uh, that colorful one is an older one by Viegas and Wattenberg who looked at Wikipedia articles. So each uh, strand there is a section of the article uh, and we can see when it was added or deleted or when edit wars occurred and so on. Uh, the lower image there is by Brandis and Lerner. Um, that's the one that has the circular pattern. Uh, that shows how Wikipedia editors interact with each other, how they undo each other's edits and support each other. Um, and then on the right is a, a tool that came out several years ago called OS Matrix that was uh, intended to visualize uh, different patterns of OpenStreetMap contribution um, between different time periods in Europe. A very nice tool that's uh, still available to browse online. Uh, and then the previous talk, you saw some exciting uh, analytics work that's going on. Um, in that OpenStreetMap analytics tool that, that will be exciting to see how that grows. Um, when we design a visual analytics tool or an application, it's good to start with some questions in mind that we want to answer. That guides the development. Um, and so some of the questions that I've had over several years of research of OpenStreetMap are how big is the crowd? So if I look at the map, how many people built that? Um, particularly in places that don't always get a lot of attention, so maybe uh, smaller cities, uh, countries, uh, Honestly, uh, outside the US, uh, it's interesting to look around the world and see how the size of the crowd varies. And how many of those are likely to be active local mappers uh, who would have a chance to do local surveys in the area? Uh, what is the degree of professional contributor influence or um, institutionally supported contributors? So uh, we have a lot of uh, companies, governments, NGOs uh, who are supporting open street mappers, encouraging people to map or paying people to map. Uh, so what is the level of that influence? Uh, how much influence can a single power contributor have? Some of you are these power contributors. You've mapped your entire town. Um, and uh, so how does that affect the map? 
And then a mysterious one on the bottom is what do one-time contributors do? We know there's a lot of people who come to the project and they just map once or one day or in one place and then they don't ever map again. What were they doing and what can we know about that? Finally, a huge question that I think is relevant to, to OSM uptake is how much do I feel that I can trust OpenStreetMap data for my area of interest? I think a lot of uh, professionals working with geospatial technologies have to ask themselves this question and grapple with it. Sometimes they fight and advocate for use of OSM data and people ask them this. So uh, can it help us understand how much we can trust OSM data if we could visualize the history? So I'm going to demonstrate a tool uh, that I've uh, worked on called CrowdLens for OpenStreetMap. Uh, that's a visual analytics tool for making sense of the crowd. Um, uh, this was uh, built as part of my work at Penn State University and it was uh, advised and assisted by Dr. Alan McEachran who uh, has a long history of cartography and visual analytics research. Um, also had help from an undergraduate research assistant, Greg Milborn, who did uh, excellent prototyping work and is building his career in uh, GIS. Um, so I appreciate their, their assistance. I'm going to do something uh, kind of brave that I don't think I've done at State of the Map, which is try to run a live demo off the internet. So uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> All right. Oh, let me go back. I want you to know that um, you can try out this tool. Uh, maybe wait until after this uh, little story is complete. I don't know how, how good Bluehost is. At, uh, <laughs> it's just hosting this on a little, um, on a little cloud service. Um, but anyway, uh, I wanted people to be able to play with this and look at it themselves. So uh, you're welcome to, to visit this site. I recommend you use a, it was designed for larger displays, so I recommend you use a, either a laptop or a desktop monitor. And uh, uh, the performance of the app is dependent on the speed of your internet connection. So uh, it's good to have a good connection, which I think we do here. So we'll give this a try. So when this tool loads, um, it's place-based, as I mentioned. So I've pre-processed the history of OSM and loaded it in for several places, which you can select from a drop-down list up here. Originally, my research and what I talked about last year at State of the Map was uh, looking at how the map has grown in smaller size cities uh, that may not, that may fly under the radar. And I think that's a good barometer of OpenStreetMap health. If you get outside the areas that are attracting a lot of attention, how can I tell uh, the if I'm achieving comprehensive coverage in my country, uh, maybe sometimes looking at the smaller cities can help us know a little bit more about that. Um, so I loaded in six cities here that were between 50 to 100,000 population on six different continents. So they're all about the same size. Uh, and then after that, I loaded in some urban neighborhoods uh, just to show uh, this tool is more of a proof of concept than anything of how it could work in uh, more urban places, uh, including Seattle. So the first uh, place that appears on here is the Seattle Center neighborhood. That's over by where the Space Needle is, Key Arena, and so on. Um, what you see up in the middle is the OpenStreetMap map in the background. And then uh, the overlay here is one user's work. And uh, down here are small maps of each user who has ever contributed in this place, in this part of Seattle. That number is 84 contributors by my count as of the end of 2015. And these are sorted right now by the number of days active in the project. Um, and you can click on a contributor and see a little bit more about them over on the right-hand side. Is this contributor here, Seattle FYI? They've done a lot of work here, uh, very good work. You can see what they do um, during the past four years mainly. And uh, this tag cloud shows uh, the types of tags that they tend to add. Uh, and then we can look down here and see um, some of the comments that they put onto their change sets. And we could do this for any user. So if we click over, uh, here's another uh, user. Uh, they moved a helipad. If we want to know a little bit more about this edit, we could click on it and it's highlighted in the map. Um, and then there's a linkage from the map to the table as well. So you could click something and see when it happened and what the comment was. Um, as you look through these maps and compare the patterns, uh, it's interesting visually sometimes there's uh, anomalies or things that stand out. We want to investigate a little bit more. Um, for example, bot activity tends to really jump out as the edits are uniform. Uh, this is uh, uh, some work that was done by a bot and we can see uh, the year that it was and what the bot was doing. Uh, other patterns uh, like this one, uh, this is kind of cool. Uh, we don't, we, we can click on this to learn a little bit more. It turns out, I believe this is a project to add public art to OpenStreetMap. Pretty cool way of using the map. One thing I noticed is that this user um, only made six change sets in the project and this is one of them. Um, so this is a the type of user that 
we could figure out, um, just came to OpenStreetMap for a short amount of time, and we could think about how to encourage them to come back to the map. Or we could look at this type of project and think, hey, I want to do a project like that too, or I want to build on this. Can give us some ideas. Um, to demonstrate a couple other capabilities of this tool, I'll switch to another area. This is going to be uh, in the public eye pretty soon. Um, in uh, Brazil, this is uh, the Copacabana area of Rio de Janeiro. Um, I showed that there's these small maps down here representing each user, and these can be sorted by different criteria. So um, let's sort by number of change sets in all of OpenStreetMap, and this will bring the uh, people who have made thousands, tens of thousands of edits in the project up to the top. Now, not surprisingly, these have done very little uh, work here in this area, just because this is one of many places around the world that they tend to map. If we want to find users who have just focused mainly on this area, uh, we could sort by percentage of the user's change sets in this place. And this brings to the top a lot of people who have just edited here and nowhere else, and some of those one-time contributors or people who just mapped a few things. Um, and reading through the comments can be informative. Sometimes we don't have any comments for those users, but other times they wrote detailed things. This person wrote in Portuguese that they mapped a grocery store that they use on a weekly basis. Here's really rich local knowledge that went into the map just from this person who made four total change sets in the project. This is the type of information that could really enrich the map and we would want to, we'd want to support. Uh, there's other interesting ones on here and reasons people come to the map. This one caught my eye. They added a local business to the map. Uh, and the name of this user was Oasis Collections. So I did a little bit of online research and found that, that this is a person who put their own business on the map and created an account for that purpose. So they want to make sure that they show up on the map and they have a presence uh, there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the, later in the talk. Uh, if we go to a, another uh, nearby place in South America, this is one of those smaller cities, uh, Tres Arroyos, Argentina. Um, looking here, you might notice that these little maps have different bands of color around them. Um, what I did was read through the, the comments, and you can see that people use their different languages as they, as they comment. Uh, this person used Spanish in almost all of their, their edits. Um, I used the automated language identification software to identify the language of the comments, and then that's what this band of color represents. So the ones with the pink bands, these are people who tended to comment in Spanish. Uh, the blue ones are in English. Now this is not a perfect indicator of where the person is from, but it does tell you if they know the native language and may be more likely to, uh, to be from near the area. Um, there's filters over here where you can filter down the language. So out of 41 total contributors in this town, um, Spanish uh, was detected for 19 of them, and then um, nine of them favored English. Um, so uh, in this particular town, there's a heavier balance of people using the local, the local language. Um, another thing is that the map itself is a filter. So as we zoom in, this number changes, and we see only uh, the number of people who affected the map view. So this really can answer the question, how many people made the map in this place, as we zoom and pan around. If we go to the center square of town, uh, there's been a lot of attention here, 15 out of those 41 people edited here. What's interesting to me is that as you pan out of this downtown region, uh, the list really narrows. And notice that all of these images have those pink bands. So these are people who tended to comment in Spanish. And there's uh, probably a more local influence on the map outside of that, that center area. That's one reason that I loaded some touristy areas into the map, is to, to do further analysis on that. Um, we can look at other places um, to look at the nature of the crowd. So here's a place in Australia. And uh, I've shown how we can look at um, the details of individual contributors as we click these images. Over on the left, though, are some filters that can be used to understand the nature of the crowd as a whole, and maybe try to find out who are the people who would be most likely to have that local influence. So uh, we could filter, for example, to find uh, the most active recent mappers, and maybe those are people we could follow up with to see if they are from the area. If we filter this down to just people who are active at least five days here, that list goes down from over 80 contributors to just four. So although there may be the appearance of a lot of mapping here, that, that number quickly goes down as we apply these filters. Um, if, we, uh, whoops, if we filter to just those people who are active within the last two years, uh, it goes down to three. And then uh, one thing that I've done is if uh, it was detected that the user has created a profile 
or a wiki page, there's a hyperlink. So we could open this and learn a little bit about the person and uh, their motives in creating the map and where they're from. Uh, this person happens to be from Australia. Um, a final thing I'd like to show here is just the different levels of coverage in these cities around the world. So uh, if we go to a city about this size, uh, this is one in Ghana that I chose uh, for analysis. Uh, there's been 14 contributors here in this area, and one that looks like they've done, uh, they've added quite a few nodes. Um, we can drill into a little more depth on who mapped what uh, by clicking the tag cloud. Um, so, um, for example, if we click highway, we see that 12 out of 14 people worked on highways, or amenities, fewer people worked on those. So these are just an example of some things that can be learned about individuals using this tool, as well as the, the crowd as a whole. Um, and for me, uh, that helped to answer some of the questions I had had about OpenStreetMap data. Um, but then I had a few more questions uh, after using this tool. Maybe some have come to your mind as well. Um, one of them is, is related, one of those questions is related to a, a talk that was given last year by Alex Barth of Mapbox, and his talk was called The Paid Mappers Are Coming. And um, when I looked at the data, I found that the paid mappers had come. So this was really true. And there's a lot of um, institutionally supported mappers that are working on, on the map. For example, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, if you filter to just the people who edited in 2015, um, I found 14 out of 34 people uh, were working for the Mapbox data team uh, on improving the data. And I knew that because they have a policy of clearly identifying themselves in their profiles, which I think is healthy. Um, but there is uh, definitely a lot of uh, institutionally supported mapping, whether it's people who are mapping on behalf of governments or companies or, or other entities. And I think it's healthy to think about the, uh, the effects of that. I think there's positive, and, and positive effects and maybe some challenges. It's definitely helping map quality, I believe. It's a good thing for the map to have additional people working on it, and it might improve the trust that we could put in the map. I would certainly trust a map more if I knew that more eyes were on the map, especially ones that were, were professional mappers. Um, but challenges may be, um, it would be healthy to look at the different changing community dynamics that would happen by introducing new groups of contributors into the map, and just making sure that local influence could continue to have a place in the map. These are the kinds of questions that are great to discuss at this conference. Uh, in this talk, I don't mean to come down on any one side or the other, but I think this is a good forum here to discuss what do we, how do we feel about this and uh, how does it affect the, the project. Um, another one is, that's interesting is how do we feel about self-promotion in OSM? So I showed an example of somebody who put their business on the map and they created an account just for that purpose. What's interesting to me is that in Wikipedia, this would be taboo. I mean, you can't write an article just about yourself and promote yourself or your business. That's kind of against uh, what they do. But in OpenStreetMap, we don't have any sort of, uh, I don't know what type of policy there is about that or how we feel about that at all. Um, I think it could be uh, useful for somebody to want to map themselves and put themselves on the map when it's done in such a way that it seems like advertising. Uh, we would need to think about uh, how we feel about that in the project. And so that's something to to discuss as a community moving forward, I would think. Uh, finally, how does knowing the contributor history affect our trust of OSM? So returning to the question that I had in large text, can I trust OpenStreetMap better? Uh, we showed this tool to 10 different professionals who tend to use uh, geospatial data in their work, and we asked them after using it, how did this change your, or how did this affect your perception of the quality of OpenStreetMap data? About half the people said it didn't affect it at all. They already had kind of staked out their opinion of OpenStreetMap data. Uh, a lot of them used the data, but they were often uh, suspicious of uh, errors creeping in, and so they, they continued to use it with those caveats in mind. Other people said that their perception of the data quality was improved, and uh, nobody said that it, they became less confident after seeing the history. And this was a sort of a surprise. Uh, because I thought that maybe seeing some of those smaller crowds as you zoom in and go to peripheral uh, uh, areas of the map out of the downtown and, and, and the more frequented places, people would get suspicious about OSM quality. Uh, on the contrary, people were um, comforted by the presence of those power mappers. So they would see those individuals that had made, spent hundreds of days editing the map in a place, and that helped them to feel better about open street map quality. So in the end, seeing the history was helpful to, uh, to a number of people uh, regarding their confidence in OpenStreetMap data. Now, this tool was created as just um, 
kind of an experiment or a proof of concept to show what things could be viewed from the history. Uh, I hope it sparked different ideas and discussion within the community. And again, I invite you to, uh, to visit the tool and to provide feedback. Uh, and happy to take questions at this time. Thank you. Question? Oh, good question. So what did I use for the language detection? I should have mentioned that. Uh, good. Uh, so I used an open source module called langid.py, L-A-N-G-I-D dot P-Y. Um, that was developed by some academic researchers and uh, uh, I was pretty happy with it. We did a little test of, um, well, we took, originally several years ago when we started using it, we were analyzing areas with uh, Spanish, English, and Portuguese. And so in our lab, we had several people who could read those languages and we just kind of quality checked it ourselves against what it said. We had about a 97% success rate with it, so we were pretty happy with it. It's certainly not perfect. And one thing that gets tricky is people use multiple languages. So a lot of times they'll use English um, and, the, and in other places they'll use their native language. That's why in this analysis we looked at all of their comments in OpenStreetMap and picked the most prevalent one um, rather than the one that was being used locally. Okay. Um, I don't know how, make sure I don't go over time here, but go ahead, we'll, we'll we take other questions. Minutes. Yeah, I have a question uh, just about having data that's uh, like more crowdsourced versus like coming from an official source, like a, someone who's actually the data owner, maybe like a government agency or something. I was wondering if, you know, I don't know, you could speak a little bit about that, if there's like mechanisms to know when something is like official data put forth by some, you know, organization. Well, yeah, so the lines between uh, uh, data in OpenStreetMap that's contributed by hobbyists and, and authoritative or official data I think are starting to get blurred because we're seeing a lot of data being imported into OpenStreetMap, first of all. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of mapping in places that have never had much mapping, digital mapping, and OpenStreetMap is it. And so then it begins to be adopted as official. So there was a talk in the other building earlier today where it showed the government of Malawi was uh, sharing out the OpenStreetMap data as the authoritative data because that was the most data that had been collected there. So I think we're seeing those lines starting to blur. The real thing I picked up in my research is that OpenStreetMap is a real mix of all kinds of stuff. There's imports, there's paid mappers, there's bots, there's hobbyists, there's one-time contributors. And we need to keep that in mind whenever we make statements about the data quality or when we look at statistics about how much data as a whole has come into the project. Maybe one more? Yeah, go ahead. The question is, as the distribution of paid mappers and bots changes over time, how does that, how does that affect my analysis? Um, I guess, well, the, the approach I wanted to take in the things that I was writing and the questions I was asking is I just wanted to go beyond uh, simple counting up of nodes or users and to get down a little deeper as to what was behind that. I think a real key to achieving that is to read through the change set comments, uh, which are in that little table in the lower right-hand corner of the application. I did not show a lot of those here, but I, I have spent hours going through those comments and reading uh, what people leave there, and it's, it's, it's helpful in getting a more rounded picture of who's, who's contributing where. Uh, now, if you just look at raw numbers over time, uh, that, it's gonna be obscured a little bit, the full story about how OpenStreetMap has morphed or changed a little bit from more of a, a hobbyist type project to one where a lot of people have our stakeholders in the project, and there's a lot of influx of data from, from different institutions. We should always keep that in mind. Thank you for the questions, and I'm happy to talk uh, anytime uh, later in the conference about this project.